Okay, today I would like to speak with everybody about a situation that I see. Um, I primarily see it within the uh, messianic circles of believers, or or even the uh, the Hebrew roots people, which you know I'm not really. Uh, anyways, I'm not going to go into that. If you're in the church, though, you you probably notice this sort of situation as well. And I I, I haven't really been in the Christian church. In a, in a few years myself, I used to observe certain things, and I, I'm sure that other people will be able to um, to come up with even more examples than some of the things that I'm speaking of. But today, I want to speak about barren fig trees. Okay, uh, I just have my phone here because I got you know I got the the Bible on my phone. But uh, in Mark chapter, you know, we have a couple different ish instances where the fig tree is mentioned in Scripture. I'm not really referring to this in the context of Israel, as many people believe, you know, the fig tree is a reference to Israel and the parable, of the, you know, the parable of the fig tree and, you know, Israel coming back into the land and all that kind of stuff. I'm talking about the fig tree in the context of um, the individual, us, okay? We're, we're all fig trees, all right? The, the parable, the barren fig tree itself Yes, it has a deeper meaning that has to do with uh, the people that were occupying the land at that time and so on and so forth uh, in needing to accept Yeshua as the Messiah. But even that parable in itself can speak to the individual on the individual level into our own lives. And um, that's really what I want to talk about briefly here for a few minutes today. So that, that, that parable is actually in Luke chapter 13. But there's another parable. Uh, it's not a parable, but it's a story in Mark chapter 11, where it says, uh, And seeing a fig tree far off and having leaves, he came, if happily he might find anything thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for the times of the figs was not yet. And it goes on, it says, And Yeshua answered and said unto it, No man eat fruit of thee here, hereafter and forever. And his disciples heard it. And then it goes on to tell about when he came into Jerusalem and, and, and so on. Now, obviously... This parable, or that story, and even the parable of the barren fig tree. The parable of the barren fig tree is, um, let me read it to you real quick. I'm sure everybody's heard it before, but it says, He spake, uh, he spake also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why cumbereth it the ground? Okay, basically he's saying, Look, I've been seeking fruit on this fig tree for a few years now. I've found none. Why are you letting this remain in the ground? Why are you letting it suck up all the resources? Cut it down. Pluck it out. Get rid of it. Okay? And, uh, and he, being the dresser of the vineyard, answered and said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I shall dig about it and dung it. Okay, saying I'm going to dig around it a little bit. I'm going to fertilize it. I'm going to try to work with it. And if it bears fruit, well, and if not, then after that, thou shalt cut it down. Now, obviously, like I said, this, that particular parable there has, um, you know, that actually has to do with uh, the Jewish people in the land at that time. Uh, and really, that, that parable in, its, in and of itself, you know, there are people that run around and I'm not really going to get too far into this because it's not the subject of the video, but there are people that run around and say, oh, the Messiah's ministry was 70 weeks. Well, if you understand what that parable of the barren fig tree is talking about, you understand that that parable in and of itself refutes that whole idea. I don't even need to go into chronologies and, and you know, time periods and trying to figure out Messiah began his ministry here and it ended there and let's find out what lines up on the calendar and who was raining at this time and that and this, that and the other. Because like I said, if you understand that parable right there, you understand that when the Messiah says, I've, uh, or, or really the, the, the owner of the vineyard is Hashem, God, okay? And the dresser of the vineyard is the Mashiach, the Messiah. Many people know as Jesus Christ. Um, or, or if, you know, if you're in the, in the, the Messianic circle or whatever, Yeshua HaMashiach, whichever. But the, that that parable in and of itself shows that the Messiah's ministry, you know, he says, I've been, or Hashem comes and says, look, I've been seeking fruit on this tree for three years. I've been seeking repentance on this tree for three years and have found none. And the Messiah says, well, let it alone this year also. Let me try to work with it for one more year. He only made it through half of that year. So, uh, 
And that would have been the three and a half year period of his ministry right there, right there encapsulated in that parable. Like I said, that's not the purpose of this video, though. The purpose of this video is to describe the, the barren fig trees that we see. Because these people are people that you should really stay away from, okay? Uh, and what I mean by that is, you see, you have to understand something that's very interesting about the fig tree. What's interesting about the fig tree is that the fig tree will produce its fruit first. It produces um, figs first. And then what it does after that is it, is it grows the leaves. So basically, Messiah, when he's coming up on this fig tree, you know, it's like he's, he's kind of off it. It's kind of off at a distance a little bit, like you, like the fig tree is over there. It's the camera, and he's sort of looking at the fig tree, and he's like, hey, that fig tree's got leaves. I'm kind of hungry. I'm going to go over here and see if I can get something to eat, because if it has leaves on it, then it should have already bore the fruit first. And really, that's why the fig tree is a real interesting picture of us as believers, okay? As a matter of fact, this is why there is this uh, controversy you know, this, I understand, just bear with me for a second here because this is related, but there's this controversy over physical circumcision that we see in the, in the Brit Hadashah or the New Testament. The reason being is because when, when you look in Acts chapter 15, that was the whole question. Do the Gentiles need to be physically circumcised when they come into the faith? And the ruling by the apostles was that, no, don't, let's not trouble the Gentiles with that let just have them abstain from these four these four things these four categories you know defilements of blood uh things strangled things sacrificed to idols um fornication and 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 obviously these have more more meaning than just one thing it's not like they said abstain from four things they said abstain from four categories of things and then james goes on to say because we or yakov goes on to say um we have those in uh we have those that are that are preaching in uh, the synagogues every Sabbath day, the law of Moses. So basically the, the Gentiles will come in, have them abstain from these four things initially because those four things were pretty prominent in their culture in those days. And they said, have them come in initially and abstain from these four categories of things and they will begin to learn the law of Moses in the synagogue every Sabbath day. So really what the apostles were doing here, and this is also what Paul's contending about in the book of Galatians, it's not that Paul was against uh, uh, physical circumcision. It's not that the apostles were against physical circumcision. Okay, you have to understand uh, some of the Jewish views of the day and, and the, the two different rabbinic schools and so on and so forth uh, that were that were prominent in uh, Jewish thought in those days and and basically what they taught and and this is what the apostles were make a long story short, the apostles were basically con concluding that we want them to experience the circumcision of the heart first, okay, what's known as the Brit Lev, or the, uh, the circumcision of the heart, before they take on what's known as Brit Milah, the circumcision of the flesh, okay, we want them, and that's really what they were doing, they're not, they weren't against physical circumcision, they were saying we want them to experience the transformation first on the inside, before they take on the uh, external, um, you know, circumcision of the flesh on, on the outside. Otherwise, it's just a ceremony and it does it means nothing. I mean, Shaul, Paul, even said himself that, um, what is it, that those those people that are circumcised, I may be chopping this verse up, please forgive me if I do, but he basically said something along the lines of if, if those people that are circumcised in the flesh don't keep the commandments, then their circumcision is counted as uncircumcision. They're looked at as if they're not even a part of the covenant. All right, but he says if people will keep the commandments, then their circumcision is counted as, or their uncircumcision is counted as circumcision. They're considered as part of the covenant. So, and this can be real, uh, you know, this can be understood in, in the light of what we're talking about here, because really that in itself is a perfect example of an external observance and that's really what the fig tree shows us okay and that's really what these parable these or i'm sorry these people that are um a part or they they represent them they basically are barren fig trees like they have they have their leaves okay but there's no fruit that's what the fig tree shows us the fig tree shows us that it produces fruit first okay it has the internal change first it produces the fruit and then it brings the covering of the leaves. Then it brings the external covering. 
okay? And that's exactly what, uh, and that's the exact kind of the opposite of what we see the barren fig tree with. The barren fig tree has the leaves and no fruit. And so what, what are some examples of some of these kind of people? Um, these people that get caught up in this sacred name movement. Oh, I, I know the name of the creator. You know, it, it's Yahuwah. Or, or, you know, you, you must call the Messiah Yahusha or whatever. All this nonsense that these people come up with. Or uh, people that go around and they want to criticize everybody. Oh, you know, you got to keep the Sabbath. You got to do this. The Christians aren't keeping the Sabbath. This and You know what I find usually with those people? That it's, there's nothing wrong with promoting the Sabbath, okay? Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. There's nothing wrong with promoting the Sabbath. There's nothing wrong with... Uh, wanting to keep the Sabbath. But what I find, though, is a lot of times these people will promote the Sabbath as, number one, a salvation issue, which it's not. Or number two, they want to criticize and bash Christians that don't keep the Sabbath. And granted, it is frustrating when the Christians reject it and they don't really fully understand it, but that's not necessarily the topic of this video. But they want to bash Christians that, that keep the Sabbath, but yet a, a lot of times these very Christians that they're bashing have better fruit than the people that are doing this promoting of the Sabbath. Because the, most of the time, what I've noticed is these people that are promoting the Sabbath, they don't keep it themselves. I don't care if you don't work on Saturday. That does not, that, that has nothing to do with keeping the Sabbath. Like a perfect example is um, the people that twist Isaiah 58 around. There's a ministry out there. I'm not going to really say the name of the ministry, but pretty much everybody that, that has seen this ministry before will know what I'm talking about. The, the ministry is a psalm number. Well, they have a teaching that says that Isaiah 58 is not, in fact, talking about the weekly Sabbath, but it's actually talking about Yom Kippur. That is complete nonsense, okay? That, all, that, all that tells me right there is if they have to twist the meaning of Isaiah 58 like that to say something that it's not saying, it's just, it just shows me that they're not actually keeping the Sabbath. Because... If you keep the Sabbath, if you understand what the Sabbath is for, and this isn't a video about the Sabbath, but I, I do intend on, on doing one, but I'm just touching on this for, for a second because, like I said, if you don't really fully understand that Isaiah 58 is the litmus test for whether or not you're keeping Shabbat, then you're probably not keeping Shabbat. You're not keeping Shabbat. You might be taking a day off of work. You might be telling people you're keeping Shabbat. You might throw around a few terms like Shabbat Shalom or Baruch Hashem or whatever, but really when it comes down to it, you're not keeping the Sabbath. And you don't fool, you don't fool Hashem, you don't fool Mashiach, and you don't fool somebody that actually keeps the Sabbath, okay? You don't, you don't fool any of those people. You don't, fool, you don't fool God, you don't fool the Messiah, and you definitely, you don't fool other people that actually know what the Sabbath is for, what it's about, or even the people that are genuinely, maybe they don't know all those things, but they're genuinely trying to keep it. But you see, these people that are barren fig trees, though, that's what they do. <coughs> they want to latch on to all the external things, you know. Oh, well, you know, I keep Shabbat. I eat kosher. You know, I do all this stuff. The irony of it is this, though. They'll sit there and say, oh, I eat kosher. I, I'm, I'm so much better than the Christians or whatever because I eat kosher. But yet they watch garbage on TV during the week. They, so the, the irony of it is there is they watch this garbage on the television or in the movie theater or whatever during the week. And yet they want to turn around and say they're better than you because you don't eat kosher and they do. And they don't even realize that they're, take, they're being mindful of the things they're taking into their physical body by eating kosher. But they're not being mindful of the things they're taking into their spiritual body by what they present before their eyes. It's nonsense. You see what I'm saying? It's an external form of religion. And back to the Sabbath for a minute. You realize you could lay in bed all day long and you could say, you know, I'm not going to violate the Sabbath. So what I'm going to do so that I don't violate the Sabbath is I'm just going to lay in the bed and I'm going to sleep the entire day. That way I'm not working. I'm not kindling a fire. I'm not doing this. I'm not doing that. And I'm not going to take any chances that anything that I do do, like maybe if I flip on the light switch. Now, I'm not I'm not all into, you know, some of these things are questionable, but but, uh, I mean, I use electricity on the Shabbat, okay? But, uh, but what I'm saying, though, is somebody could say, well, I'm, not gonna, I'm just going to lay in bed the entire day so I don't violate any of it. There's no possible way me just laying in bed that I'm going to violate the Shabbat. And then if, they, if that was their attitude, though, they're actually violating the Shabbat. 
Because this is why Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, this is why he says the letter kills, but the spirit brings life. There's nothing wrong with the letter of the law. Paul is not teaching against the letter of the law, okay? What he's teaching against, though, is a strict, rigid observance of only the letter of the law and not understanding the spiritual principle behind it. Now, granted, in Judaism, Judaism teaches that even if we don't understand the commandments, we should still observe them. But any commandment that you're observing, if you're keeping Shabbat, if you're eating kosher, if you're celebrating the festival days, you know, any of these different things, any of the, any, if you're doing any of the, the things that are regarded as tradition in Judaism, okay? Like, for instance, blowing the shofar, this is Elul. This right now when I'm taping this, this, this is the month of Elul, okay? It's a tradition. It's not a commandment to blow the shofar every day during Elul. But if, you blow, if you're going to blow the shofar every day during, during the month of Elul, which is just a tradition, um, then you should at least understand why you're blowing the shofar for Elul. You should understand the, what, what the whole purpose of the month of Elul is, with the king being in the field, uh, uh, the significance of that, what, it, uh, what, what the acronym of Elul stands for, Anila Dodi Vadodi Li, what that means, you know, uh, Anila Dodi means uh, I am to my beloved, means I return to Hashem, okay, I come back to God. And Vidodi Li means my, as my beloved is to me, which means I return to God and God returns to me. That's the whole time, time frame of this period right now. But if you're just blowing the shofar because oh, somebody told me to blow the shofar every day during, during a lul. Well, you know, like I said, it's not even a mitzvah. It's not even necessarily a commandment as far as I know. As far as I know, it's a, it's a tradition. But, uh, but you're really kind of missing the mark then. It's the same way if, if you were to just lay in bed all day during the Shabbat. If you were to lay in the bed all day during the Shabbat, you don't understand that the Sabbath is for growing close to Hashem. It's for... Um, uh, re reaching a spiritual elevation. Having a taste of what's known as Alam Haba or the world to come. And, and by doing so, you need to observe it in the context that God has defined. It's not about legalism. It's about, you see, that's the whole thing about it. If, if somebody was really keeping the Shabbat, this is why, without going too far into it and, it, like, and, and without explaining it too deeply, this is why I know if somebody's going to twist Isaiah 58 to say that it's talking about Yom Kippur and that it's not talking about the Shabbat, I know they're not keeping the Shabbat. Because the simple fact of the matter is, the, their whole perspective on that is, well, it says that I can't do my own pleasure on the Shabbat. So this must not mean the weekly Shabbat because I want to do my own pleasure on the weekly Shabbat. If Hashem was your pleasure, you wouldn't have, it would be a no-brainer, okay? If Hashem, that's why I said Isaiah 58 is a litmus test for those that actually keep Shabbat. If Hashem was your pleasure, you wouldn't even have to look at that verse and say, what do you mean I can't go play soccer? What do you mean I can't go fishing? What do you mean... You mean I can't go ride the airboat or the four-wheeler or whatever? No, it's not about that. It's not about a legalistic context. It's about, oh my goodness, Shabbat is coming. Hashem has promised me that this one day out of the week, I get to actually, this is a day that he's guaranteed. If I seek him out on this day and I observe it in the proper context, he will come down and meet with me. And therefore, because he comes down and meets with me, I will actually ascend into heaven, so to speak. In a figurative sense, I will get a taste of the world to come. And hopefully, I'll, I will experience a spiritual renewal that will get me through the next six days so that, I can, uh, so that I can be ready to observe the Shabbat on the seventh day again when it's coming again. That's the whole difference between a person that observes Shabbat in a form of legalism, a person that is a barren fig tree, they've got the leaves but no fruit, and a person that actually takes pleasure in Hashem and observes Shabbat for what it is. And that's why they understand what Isaiah 58 is talking about. But these people that are bearing fig trees, they want to argue about all this stuff, man. Like, and they want to think they're so much better than everybody. Oh, you know, the day, the day begins at this. It's not wrong to, to want to know these things. It's not wrong to want to know the calendar, when the month actually begins, when the day begins. It's not wrong to have a healthy discussion about it. But when you go around and you start like presenting some of these things or, or even wanting, you know, I, I mean, wanting to possibly know what the name of the creator is or whatever. But 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 this Yahua crowd and this Yahusha crowd and a lot of these time, a lot of these these people, this is a it's a covering so that they they think that, oh, because I know this name that, well, you know, I'm good. I'm spiritually up there. I'm, I'm elevated above everybody else and this, that, and the other. And they don't even realize that that's just a covering so they can't see the spiritual problem within. 
And that's what I'm saying. Like, for instance, you can't keep Shabbat back to Shabbat. I like using Shabbat because there's a lot of people that think they're keeping Shabbat and they're not keeping Shabbat. There's a lot of people who think they're eating kosher and they're not eating kosher, but they want to go around. Oh, stupid Christians eating their pork and their pigs and eating their shellfish and this, that, and the other. Well, let me tell you what, friend. If you're buying your beef at the grocery store, you're not eating Shabbat. Or eating Shabbat. I hope you're not eating Shabbat. But you're not eating kosher. You can call me a Pharisee, you can call me a Talmudic, whatever, you can call me a, 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 a Judaizer, or whatever. The simple fact of the matter is, you're not eating Shabbat. When you, or, there I go again. See, I've been talking about Shabbat, and I'm trying to talk about eating kosher. But uh, you're not eating kosher, okay? And I'm not criticizing you if you're not eating kosher. But what I'm trying to say is, there's people out, I'm criticizing you if you're not eating kosher, and you're criticizing others that, that don't eat kosher. Matter of fact, I eat kosher. I eat rabbinically kosher. I'm not here to brag about it to you, but what I'm trying to say is I don't go around and persecute or criticize other people that don't eat kosher, but you can be rest assured if I see you trying to push that nonsense onto somebody else and I know you don't eat kosher, yeah, I'm going to rebuke you over it. Yes, I'm going to rebuke you over it. That's the simple fact of the matter. Because you yourself... That just makes you a hypocrite. You're not doing it, yet you're talking about somebody else who doesn't do it. And really, when it comes down to it, it's kind of a non-essential issue anyway. It's not a salvation issue. And that's the way with the Sabbath right now, too. I know that's going to blow a lot of people's minds. That's going to really probably rain on a lot of people's parades or whatever. But the simple fact of the matter is stop keeping Shabbat just because you think it makes you better than everybody else. Keep the Sabbath because you actually want to grow close to Hashem. That's the whole point of it. And really, you can't impose it upon anybody right now because we're all in exile. We don't live under a society that's governed by the Torah. If Shabbat was in effect right now, if it was actually... It's not that the commandment's not valid. It's that it's not enforced. If it was enforced, then by all means, if you see people cannot keep a Shabbat, you better get your stones. But if you do that, you'll go to jail, and rightfully so, because what right do you have to impose something, to enforce something that Hashem himself is not enforcing right now? Which, I can prove that out of scripture. That's not my opinion. But that's not the point of this video either. I plan on making a video about this topic as well. But that's what I'm trying to say. Stay away from the people that have this external observance, but yet, and, and like with Shabbat, for instance, they keep, y'all, I keep Shabbat, this, that, and the other, but then during the week, they lie, they cheat. They cheat at their business, they cheat customers, they steal, they, they post obscene things, they swear, they get drunk on a regular basis. They have no idea what biblical purity is. They have no idea what actual kedusha or holiness is. But yet they think they're, they're, they're God's gift to everybody else because they keep the Sabbath. They keep the Sabbath in their own eyes though. That's the whole point of what I'm saying. And that's what you got to watch out for. Watch out for these people, all right? Because the simple fact of the matter is they're trying to drag you into their delusion. It's not about promoting these things or sharing these things with people. That's not. It's not that it's bad. But what I'm saying, though, is I see too many people doing it. And really, they them, they're like I see too many people promoting stuff. And they themselves aren't actually doing what they are promoting. And that's called hypocrisy. And you have no place to stand before Hashem in hypocrisy. You have no place to stand when Messiah comes if you're a hypocrite. You think you're keeping the law, but actually you're the very one that he's talking to when he's going to say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. You that do not, you that are practicing lawlessness. I never knew you. I don't know who you are. I don't know where you came from. I don't know where you learned this stuff from. So that's really all I wanted to say. I probably rambled on about it too long now. I try to keep the video short. Because I realize a lot of people don't have, have good attention spans. But even if you're in the Christian church and you don't fully understand some of the things that I'm talking about, you see the same kind of situations in Christianity as well. It's, it's basically called going through the motions. People that have this external, you know, uh, you know, I tithe every week, I do this, that, and the other. I mean, I, like I said, I haven't been in the Christian church. Really what it boils down to is this. Did you do what Messiah said? Okay? This would... This would uh, this would be a, a word for everybody, whether you're in Christianity or whether you're in Messianic circles or whatever. Did you do what Messiah said? Messiah said, take up your cross today, every day, and follow me. He says, crucify your desires. Place yourself on the altar. Paul said, make your body a living, make your life a living sacrifice. Okay? Nullify yourself. Cause yourself to um, basically, you know, put, put your own desires and your own... 
self-seeking self-centeredness, your, your own pleasures, your own this, that, and the other on hold and actually seek after what it is that God is wanting to do, what it is that God's wanting to use you for, use your resources that God has given you in order to, uh, to help people or to be for the good of his kingdom or whatever and so on and so forth. And, uh, that's really, um, that's really, like I said, these people that are, are barren fig tree that have this external form of obser- of, of observance they they lack that internal they lack that internal holiness they lack that internal uh, desire to really truly give their life to Messiah and 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 to seek him out and to be that to be that living sacrifice. So I hope everybody uh, got you know at least got something out of this. I'm sure. Believe me, I see plenty of people that that fit right into the category of what I'm talking about. So I hope. Um, this will help us all to grow. And believe me, I'm speaking to myself before everybody. All of us always have room for improvement. So uh, I hope that this, you know, finds everybody in a, in a right spirit. And I hope that the spirit, I hope God will bring down his spirit and, uh, and, and convict us, convict us all on the things that uh, we're doing right. And then the things that we might not be doing right. And then, uh, and then when we see, um, when we see people acting in this way, I hope that he will sharpen our discernment so that we know to stay away from those people. Because like I said, those people want to drag you down. Okay, those people, and believe me, the devil's slick. All right, the adversary is slick. He will use these people in ways that you never, they might call you on the phone or they might see you at work or whatever. And, and you know, oh, I'm tour observing this, that, and the other. And then they want to turn around and, uh, they want to start murdering somebody with their words. They want to start uh, just gossiping about somebody. And I'm not talking about, like, sometimes there's a problem, people, and you need to mention it. But I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about people that are just, you know, up in everybody's business and all this, that, and the other, and, and so on. So, um, yeah, hypocrisy comes in many forms. So, let's all try to be genuine. Let's all try to be real. And let's stay away from those people that we can see or not. And as always, I'd like to thank you for your time.